What is up Nightcrawlers? Welcome back to the Nightmare's Edge. Thank you so much for being here. Now, sit back, relax, and let me tickle those inner fears. The story of the death of Elisa Lamb is a case that has captivated the public since it happened back in 2013. Because of the mysterious and unusual circumstances surrounding the tragic incident, it's no surprise why. While a lot of people think that the cause of her death was due to something easily explainable, others think that there was something more sinister responsible. On January 26, 2013, Elisa Lamb, a tourist from Canada, would arrive in Los Angeles, California. Two days later, she would check in at the infamous Cecil Hotel. Even though she had initially booked hostel-style accommodations at the hotel, she was eventually given her own room by staff when her roommates complained about her odd behavior. More incidents of her odd behavior would be documented in the days to follow, including Elisa leaving notes that would read, Go Home and Go Away, that would be directed at her roommates. Days before her disappearance, she would even be escorted off the premises by security from a live taping of a late night show in Burbank. On February 1st, the day Elisa was scheduled to check out of the Cecil Hotel, her parents in Canada had not heard back from their daughter, someone who had frequently been calling them with updates regarding her trip. After a police report was filed by her parents, it soon became apparent that Elisa had gone missing. Even with the help of the local authorities and the media shortly after, Elisa's whereabouts were still unknown. But it wasn't until a security video from an elevator was shown on the news that the case would really grab the interest of the public. On the roughly four minute video, reported to be the last known sighting of Elisa anywhere, it showed the young woman acting bizarrely. Because of how odd she was behaving in the video, more and more of the public started taking an interest in the whole ordeal. But, despite the sudden urgent attention regarding the missing woman, there was still no breaks in the case. Unfortunately, it wouldn't come until other guests in the hotel started experiencing something that would eventually turn out to be horrific. Some guests at the Cecil started to complain of low water pressure in their rooms. Others would complain about the discoloration of the water, with a few of them actually reporting the water to be coming out of the faucets black. Some poor souls had even reported the water had a disgusting taste. Due to all the complaints, a maintenance worker was eventually sent to check on the water tanks that sat on top of the roof of the hotel. But, upon opening the hatch of one of the water tanks, the maintenance worker would make the gruesome discovery. There, floating naked, staring up from the water, was Elisa Lamb's dead and decomposing body. The authorities would eventually determine that she had been dead for a while considering the amount of decomposition and bloating her body had undergone. After an autopsy, the cause of death was eventually determined to be an accidental drowning after Elisa had fallen into the water tank. With Elisa's diagnosed bipolar disorder and depression, as well as the medications she was taking at the time because of it, it's easy to see why the official report made the most sense. Her odd behavior during the days leading up to her disappearance only strengthened the idea that she had most likely gone through a manic episode before her death. But despite the official report, that didn't stop the public from providing their own theories on what they thought actually happened to the poor girl. Because the Cecil Hotel is near a rough part of Los Angeles, some think that Elisa Lamb was the victim of a homicide. But with the autopsy report showing no signs of trauma to the body usually associated with murder, homicide was unlikely to be the cause. Some conspiracy theorists, though, claim that the person or persons responsible for her death might have worked for the hotel. A few have argued that the elevator video seemed to be edited in an effort to conceal the identity or revelation that someone did indeed interact with Elisa before her death, but there is still no evidence to back up this theory. Others, however, have suggested something more out of the ordinary. Some people claim that Elisa's death was due to something supernatural. While the mysterious factors surrounding her death are already spine-chilling by themselves, part of what makes them even more eerie is the fact that the circumstances involved closely resemble the plot of a Japanese horror film that came out several years before. In the movie, a character in the film had experienced issues with the water coming out of her faucet before discovering the dead body of a girl in a water tank on the building's rooftop. 
But despite the uncanny similarities between Elise's death and the horror film, the dark and bloody history of the Cecil Hotel is enough to be the basis of a horror film in itself. Aside from the many suicides and murders that have taken place in and around the establishment, a few of the hotel's previous residents have included serial killers like Jack Unterwerger and the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. It is even claimed that one of Los Angeles' most infamous murder victims, Elizabeth Short, also known as the Black Dahlia, had stayed at the hotel before her death. Because of the Cecil Hotel's haunted past, it's no wonder why some think ghosts might be responsible for Elisa's death. Elisa's strange behavior during the elevator video only helped to support the theory. During the elevator footage, it looked as if Elisa had been talking and interacting with someone that couldn't be seen on the video. Some speculated it was because the individual was someone or something paranormal. Some of the same people also claimed that Elisa might have conjured up evil spirits when she was partaking in a ritual called the elevator game. In the game, a person would press a series of buttons on the elevator to activate the appearance of a ghost or transport themselves to a different realm. And that's exactly what some think Elisa is seen doing on the video. So is it possible that Elisa really did become the victim of the supposed many ghosts that inhabit the hotel? We may never know. Regardless of what was the cause of Elisa Lamb's tragic death, what is clear is that she is now just another part of the Cecil Hotel's dark history. I live in a small apartment alone. I will not disclose where I live or my name, but what I'm about to tell you is absolutely true and has been happening to me on a daily basis. 
The reason I'm writing about it is because I am desperate and I am hopeful this might help or someone can help me. I suffer from insomnia. Every night I go to bed and cannot fall asleep. I can only sleep if I take pills. Still, my sleep is terrible. I have nightmares every single time. Nothing's happened to me in my life. I've had no traumas. Nothing. The nightmare started a few months ago, and I'm always dreaming about the same thing. A black figure appears near my bed and doesn't move, just stares at me. I cannot make out what it is because it's too dark, but it's always the same. I wake up and see it at my side of the bed, staring at me. I have my eyes open, but cannot move the rest of my body. Last night was the worst one, and that is the reason I'm writing this. Like always, before bed, I took my pills to help me sleep. I get to bed and close my eyes, hoping this time is the one that I am going to be able to sleep without these crazy nightmares. Like clockwork, I woke up again in the middle of the night. This time, something is different, because usually, the figure is already at my side. Not this time. I could not see it anywhere. But, that's when I look at my feet, and I start seeing the figure appearing slowly. It's too dark in the beginning for me to see it clearly. It's the same black shadow every night. Not this time. Slowly, the figure starts becoming more and more clear, and I can see its face. I woke up immediately feeling my heart bursting out of my chest. Tonight, I decided to write this and ask for help because I don't know what is happening to me, but I do feel that the figure is getting closer to me. Please help me. I was just having a normal day chilling at home watching Netflix. I remember it was raining outside and listening to the sound was even more relaxing. After a couple of hours and after binging a lot of episodes, I had to get up and use the toilet. As I approached the door, something unexplainable happened. When I'm about to enter the toilet, I fell, but not onto the ground. Into the ground. I didn't see any holes and I'm very sure there isn't one there, but still. I had fell through the ground into another place that wasn't supposed to be there. Not knowing where I was at that point, I took a look around, confused and scared. The only thing I could see was a massive, large corridor covered in yellow wallpaper. It was illuminated by big, white LEDs that emit a very loud buzzing. The ground was covered in a grayish carpet that was wet everywhere, and in some places, you could see puddles of what I thought was water. The stench of wet carpet and moisture was everywhere and was intoxicating. I took out my phone and realized I had no reception. Maybe it was because I was underground, but there wasn't any structure built under my house. I had no explanation for what was happening. Confused, I started walking forward with no idea where I was going. A couple of hours have passed and everything looked the same, and when I say a couple of hours, I mean I had no idea. My phone and my watch were stopped. There were only a bunch of corridors with the same wallpaper everywhere. Everything looked the same. Desperate, I tried screaming for help. Nothing. The only noise I could hear was the deafening buzzing from the LEDs on the ceiling. That was until I crossed one of the corridors. I saw behind a wall, something very thin, moving, like a very thin arm. I was a bit far, but it looked like a hand at the end. I asked if someone was there with a trembling voice. No one answered and the arm pulled back. I gave a step forward, but all of a sudden, something appeared from the corner, emitting a deafening screech sound that echoed through the corridors. Shocked and terrified, I could only take a glimpse of what that thing was. It looked humanoid in the sense of having arms and legs, but its head was massive and skin dark and wrinkled. It kept screeching and coming in my direction. I turned around and ran for my life, not knowing where to go. All looked the same until I reached a dead end. This was it. I had no time to go back because the creature was already closing the only exit from the corridor. As I'm walking backwards, crying and screaming, the creature also walks towards me. 
When it reached inches from my face, I took one more step into a water puddle, and magically, I reappeared in my house, on the same spot where I had fallen into that yellow nightmare. I was sitting on the ground leaning against the wall, thinking what the hell just happened. Was this something supernatural? A glitch in reality? Whatever it was, it made me leave my house on the very next day, and I never looked back. I am a security guard at a local parking lot. There isn't much to say about it, but I do like it. I don't have to deal with a lot of people and I can enjoy the silence of the night. That was until last night. I was in my chair in front of the monitors when I saw something outside. It was snowing, but I could have sworn I saw something out there. At first, I didn't pay much attention because I lost it somehow. But then I sat down again in my chair and after a while, I started listening to weird humming noises coming from the outside. I looked at the monitors to check what was out there, and that's when I saw something on top of the roof. It looked like a person, at least the shape, but I didn't have a clear picture of what it was until it appeared in front of my window. Panicking, I got up and leaned against the wall. In this situation, we can't call for help from the central, and that's what I did, but no one answered. While I was on the radio, the thing was trying to pull down the door. I tried speaking, but to no avail. It tried again to pull the door down, so I took out my gun and fired a few shots. After that, there was only silence and the wind blowing outside. I was on edge the rest of the night, still not knowing what it was. I have to go to work again tonight. I was washing dishes when it happened for the first time. It started with small stomps on the wooden floor. It kept me guessing on what it was because I live alone with no pets. It must have been noises from the house settling, I thought. One night while watching TV, I could swear I heard whispering behind me. It scared the living crap out of me. I couldn't make out where exactly the noises were coming from, but they were getting more and more intense scratching and whispering at the same time. It was like I couldn't make out exactly what it was, but it was definitely happening. It has been like this every single night, but the noises change sometimes. There are nights I listen to the pipes, like someone is hitting them. Other nights come the whispers and loud stomps on the floor. It's like other people are living here with me. I am already spooked, but I am trying to be rational about this. Also, I cannot move out because I have nowhere else to go, and I put my money in this house. Now, if this wasn't enough, a few nights ago I started having weird dreams that happened in my house. It started with the door under the stairs, the one that leads to the basement. It was just me staring at the door, but something felt different. It was like the door was calling to me. I have been several times in my basement, but never felt like this. It was like a dark aura was around the door. It made me not want to go to the basement again, or even get close to that door. Luckily, I mostly use the basement for storage, so I don't really have to use it often. I kept dreaming about the door, always thinking there would be something reasonable that could explain what was happening. That was until my last dream. The door started opening and I got closer and peeked inside. That's when I saw pairs of eyes coming from the darkness below. And behind them, slowly I started making out a creature with horns. I woke up at that moment in horror. What are these nightmares? What is happening to me? Is my basement door some kind of gateway to somewhere? I don't know what to do. I'm going to tell you something I never imagined possible. Being a skeptical person that never believed in the supernatural, or whatever creatures that supposedly exist out there, 
This story happened during my late 20s and I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Friday night during a session of browsing and chatting on the internet with my online friends. Because I lived in the suburbs, it's common for me to spend more time at home. Also, because nothing exciting happens in my neighborhood, or so I thought till that day. Like I was saying, it was a Friday night and I was on my laptop when I started listening to noises coming from trash cans directly under my window, between the fence and the side of my house. I usually don't pay attention to this because there is a forest area behind my house, so it's common for raccoons to come close to the houses and mess up garbage cans. But the noise was already annoying me and was getting louder, so I went downstairs to scare the raccoons away. When I reached the kitchen, I peeked through the window to the trash cans, and as I thought, there was trash on the ground and one of the cans was laying sideways. I got angry now because I had to go outside and pick up the trash before any more raccoons would come and make an even bigger mess. I got closer to the back door and opened it. As soon as I put my eyes in the backyard, my body froze. The first thing I saw, behind the bushes was a tall figure that was too big to be a man. Also, the silhouette didn't look like one. Shocked, I kept looking at the figure and with time my vision started adapting to the darkness and I could start to really see what was in front of me. It had a muscled body and the head that looked like a dog. In a matter of seconds, the creature's eyes locked on me and it began to growl. This is when I managed to close the door and moved away but I kept my eyes on the door. A few seconds passed and I could hear the steps of the creature walking in the door's direction. When it reached the door, the growling stopped, but another chilling sound started. The sound of claws scratching on the door. I will never forget that sound. I slowly walked to the corner of my living room, not knowing what to do but just trying to stay hidden. That's when I listened to the creature moving around the house, going towards the side, near the kitchen window. I was terrified, but I needed to see that thing again. So I locked my eyes on the kitchen window and that's when I saw it again. It stopped in front of the window, growling and looking around, like it was hunting me. In a moment of sheer panic, I ran upstairs to my bedroom, locked everything and closed myself in the closet. The situation felt like a nightmare. I wasn't capable of rational thought and couldn't even think of calling 911. But then again, what was I going to say? No one would ever believe me. I cried myself to sleep inside that closet. The only time I had courage to come out was in the morning. Fortunately, the creature was already gone, but it left the back door with a few scratch marks. I researched online and it looks like I had an encounter with the dogman. There are a few witnesses that had similar encounters with the creature looking like this one. One thing is for sure, it made me a believer. Rebecca sat on the couch reading a book she had just bought from an estate sale, Incantations from the Dark Side. Rebecca didn't believe in such things, but she loved the imagery throughout the book and figured it'd be fun to have something scary to read to start her weekend. Most of the book had rituals and incantations that were way more time consuming and complicated than Rebecca was willing to try. But still, it was interesting seeing the vast collection of supposed black magic from the old world. When Rebecca turns to the next page, she is met with the drawing of a horrific creature. Aside from the imagery, the simplicity of the incantation has intrigued her as well. It reads, There exists something from a different plane of existence, and it can cross over to ours with your insistence. Recreate the symbol followed by taps of three, and that is everything you need to conjure thee. If you hear three taps from outside, it will be wise to run and hide. For if you give in to your curiosity, you will come face to face with the monstrosity. As Rebecca turns the page, there on the next page, 
she sees the symbol. Rebecca knew it was silly, but it was too hard to resist. What's the harm, she thought to herself. She proceeds to pour a little bit of wine from a hardly touched glass of wine. With the small puddle, she uses her finger to recreate the symbol from the book, and just like the incantation instructs, she taps on it three times. Eagerly, she sits quietly, waiting and listening to see if the incantation had worked. But after a few moments, there is nothing but silence. Rebecca scoffs. Pfft, what a surprise. Nothing but horse crap as usual. But before Rebecca could finish her sentence, there are three taps on the window. Rebecca freezes. Her eyes are transfixed on the window where the taps came from. But after a few uncomfortable moments of silence, she shakes her head. Ha, get it together, Rebecca. You haven't even started the drink, Rebecca jokes to herself. She gets up to fetch some paper towels from the kitchen, but before she's able to take more than a few steps, there are three more taps from the window. Rebecca spins around. The hairs on the back of her neck are standing. Her body is full of goosebumps, her eyes wide and staring at the window. It can't be. There's no way. Rebecca tries to convince herself it's just a coincidence. But just as she's in the middle of her thoughts, three more taps from the window. Rebecca is shaken to her core. For the first time in her life, she starts to believe what if. What if these old incantations are real? And even though she's beyond frightened, a feeling of curiosity overwhelms her. For some reason, she can't resist the temptation to look. She shakes as her feet move closer and closer to the window. As she stands in front of the drapes, her hands reach out to grab them, ready to open them. Her heart is thumping as she's drenched in fear. She stands in place, shaking and sweating. Three more taps on the window, this time much louder. Her eyes open wide, thinking about what she might see. But despite her gut instinct telling her not to open the drapes, she does. With a quick swipe of the curtains, Rebecca comes face to face with nothing. There is nothing but the darkness of the night outside. Her eyes dart side to side, looking for a trace of anything unusual. But she sees nothing aside from a small tree's branch swaying in the wind. That's what must have been tapping on the window, Rebecca tells herself. Breathing heavily, Rebecca is confused but relieved. But just as she's about to close the drapes, three taps. Rebecca is completely stricken with terror, but this time, not only did she hear three taps again, but she felt them right on her shoulder. I had always heard about those videos on YouTube about people supposedly buying mystery boxes off the dark web. Whether they were true or not, I still found it fascinating. So one day, I decided to finally buy one and see if they were worth all the hype or not. Even though I'd been going through the dark web for a while, this would actually be the first time I'd be purchasing something. Through some recommendations, I found a site that sold some of these mystery boxes. How they obtained them, I have no idea but the prices were surprisingly low. I'm guessing that a lot of these people involved just love gathering and making this stuff like it was a hobby. Even though I almost backed out, I eventually ordered one. After a few weeks, a package without a return address finally arrived at my door. At first, I was hesitant to open it, but after a little bit of alcohol, I finally gathered the courage to do so. Inside of the brown shipping box was a smaller box. I used my pocket knife to cut through all the tape it was wrapped in. My gut instinct was telling me this might not be a good idea, but my morbid curiosity was just too much to ignore. I took a deep breath before finally taking a look inside. Right from the start, I was hit with a strong scent of pine. I was confused at first but soon realized it was due to all the car fresheners scattered inside. Weird, I thought, but I quickly threw them to the side. Next thing I saw was a keychain of a plastic toy rabbit. It was so cute, I actually wasted no time hooking it to my keys. When I looked back in the box, that's when I noticed the purse. 
I was kind of surprised when it was one of the purses that I knew must have cost more than I paid for the mystery box itself. Maybe it was a knockoff, I told myself. After setting it aside, I continued digging into the box, but what I saw next started to give me an uneasy feeling. At first, I didn't know what it was, but after a bit of unfolding, I realized it was a pair of latex gloves. And all over them was some kind of dark brown substance that had turned into crust. This could be anything, I thought to myself. However, the smell it gave off was that of rust. Just like the other items, I put them aside as well, but at this point, I started to get a bit concerned. I had no intention of stopping though. The next thing I saw was a layer of fabric. Upon inspecting it, I could feel something inside. After unfolding, I realized what it was. A lock of blonde hair tied together with a ribbon. The feeling of something being wrong was now getting stronger and stronger, but a part of me kept trying to convince myself that this was just a prank. I was just way too curious to see the rest of the contents of the box. I took out another layer of fabric, and that's when I saw it. There, laying on a towel, was a large kitchen knife. Its blade was heavily stained with the same brown substance that had crusted over the latex gloves. The smell of iron was overwhelming. By this stage, I knew exactly where this was going. If this was a prank, it was a convincing one, and really messed up. This could just be animal blood, I thought to myself. However, if this isn't a prank, the next thing I might see might be something I'm not prepared for. Convincing myself that it could all just be a prank, I held my breath and uncovered the last layer. Relief and confusion came over me as I didn't see anything instantly concerning. However, there at the bottom of the box was a case with a DVD. And upon looking at it closely, I noticed that it's labeled, Watch Me. No freaking way, I thought to myself. Even if this was a prank, I was still too scared to watch what could possibly be on that DVD. But even though every fiber of my being told me to stop, I couldn't. I had to find out how this prank, if it was a prank, ended. I took another swig of my beer and forced myself to put the DVD inside my computer. Even though I was shaking at the thought of what I was about to see, I eventually pressed play. What I saw next is something I will never forget. Sitting, tied to a chair, was a woman inside a dark room that looked like a basement. She had blonde hair, and even though her blonde hair covered a lot of her face, I could tell her eyes were swollen from crying. Duct tape covered her mouth, but I could hear her crying through it. As horrified as I was, I couldn't help but continue to watch. It wasn't more than a few seconds later that a masked man appeared on the screen and in one of his hands was a large kitchen knife that looked similar to the one from the box. I watched in horror as he raised the knife to her hair and cut a piece off. He then tied it together with a ribbon before putting it in his pocket. This is all just a prank, I kept muttering to myself. But just as I started second guessing watching the rest of the video, that's when I saw the masked man take the knife and place it on top of the woman's index finger. I could see her finger with the pink fingernail trembling from fear. My stomach dropped at the thought about what he was about to do, and before I knew it, he proceeded to slice her finger off. I could hear her muffled screams of pain as the masked man eventually severed her finger. That looked too real, I told myself, horrified. And before I could even shut off the video, that's when the masked man quickly took his knife and sunk it into the woman's stomach. I gasped as I jumped out of my chair, but the horror didn't stop. He then proceeded to cut her belly open as she squirmed in the chair, and by the time he had cut her torso from one side to the other, her intestines had spilled out over her legs. I quickly turned the video off, but by then it was too late. I had seen more than I wanted to. My heart was thumping so hard by that point that I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I also felt like I was going to throw up and faint from shock. But even after seeing all that, I was still trying to convince myself it could still be a prank. And even on the chance it was real, I had no intention of finding out. I quickly took the box and all the contents over to a forest nearby and burned it. In the chance it was real, I didn't want to be caught in possession of what could be evidence. I especially didn't want to be caught with a possible murder weapon. But after burying all the items, I was still paranoid for the next few days. What if the person or people responsible for sending me the mystery box paid me a visit? 
What if they call the cops on me? I was such a mess that I started to drink more than usual, but after a week had passed, I started to calm down a little. However, I still continued to drink to take the edge off. Unfortunately, while out on the drive, I was pulled over by a cop. He told me he'd noticed I was driving kind of erratically, and after taking a breathalyzer test, it was determined that I was a little over the alcohol limit. But since I was driving in the middle of nowhere and no priors, the cop decided to give me a break. Since my house was just a few blocks away, he had escorted me just to make sure I got home safely. But just as he was about to hand me back my keys, he noticed a strange smell coming from it. Both of us were confused as to what could be causing the smell. That's when the cop noticed the bottom of the toy looked like it had been cut open and sealed. After poking at it with the knife, he was eventually able to open it and shake something loose from within. As the object fell into his other hand, we both looked on in horror as we realized what it was. There, in his palm, was the severed rotting finger of a woman with a pink fingernail. One day I decided to take my camera out to the woods and do some photography. While I was a portraiture and wedding photographer, my main passion is nature photography. I just love walking through nature by myself, just me, my camera, and the beauty and serenity of nature. This time, I was looking for the best photo I could take, looking around the scenery while listening to the sounds of nature, including the birds. However, the birds flew away and everything went quiet. That was when I heard a crying, which doesn't sound like it's from an animal, but from a baby. I walked toward the crying, bewildered. I eventually saw a pram just in the middle of the woods, nobody else around. I, without thinking, approached the pram. As I got close, I realized that the crying was repetitive, like it was on a loop. There was a blanket on the pram. I took it and saw what I should have expected to see, a speaker. I turned around and suddenly I got tackled to the ground. Someone got me in a rear naked choke and was choking me. I struggled to get up until I blacked out. When I woke up, I was lying face down on the ground. My hands tied behind my back and my shirt had been taken off. My shirt had been ripped off and used to bind my hands. I looked up and saw a bulky grizzled man in hunter's clothing, holding a bowling knife looking down at me. He had a rifle leaned up against the tree. Hello, sweetheart, he said. I told him to let me go. He just chuckled. Even though I thought I was screwed, I was worried about my camera. I asked him where it was. He said he was going to sell it, but told me my photos were beautiful. I got angry and yelled at him to let me go, or I will fucking kill him. He smiled, walked up to me, and kneeled down beside me. He caressed my cheek before he brushed the knife across my bare belly. I was screaming at him to get off of me and to let me go. He pushed me onto my belly and whispered in my ear, he wants to play a game. That's when he got up and stomped on my legs and my ankle multiple times. I screamed and groaned as he did so. That should stop you from running too far. He then pushed me over and cut my shirt, unbinding my wrists. He then walked over and grabbed his rifle. I'll give you a head start. I quickly realized what was going on so I got up and ran as fast as I could. I managed to get some distance, dodging a bear trap on the way. Until my leg became too much, I couldn't help but slow down. I knew I couldn't keep running far enough, so my flight responses turned into fight. I grabbed a big stick and hid behind a tree. I waited for what seemed like a long time until I heard leaves crunching. I was too scared to peek from behind, so I waited and just hoped he wouldn't peek around the tree. Eventually, he came close. I swung the big stick at him, hitting him on the shoulder. He fired the rifle but dropped it. He grabbed me by the throat and wrestled the stick away from me. He then punched me in the belly and pushed me down. On the floor, I looked up at him. He had a big grin on his face looking down at me. Nice try. You actually managed to hurt me. He chuckled. He started to reach down for his rifle. I immediately got up using my adrenaline and grabbed his rifle just as he did. I managed to take a rifle away and took a step back. Before I could even aim, the man pulled out his bowie knife and lunged towards me. 
I managed to point the gun towards his gut and shot him point blank in the stomach as he swung the knife towards me, cutting my shoulder, and he fell to his knees. While falling, he managed to knock me over. I immediately crawled backwards and got to my feet, pointing the rifle towards his head as he kneeled holding his gut. You shot me, he said. I shouted back. Stay down or the next shot will be between your eyes. I was enraged and wanted to kill him right there, but I couldn't bring myself to kill another human being. Even with a monster like him, I never wanted to be a killer. So instead, I hit him in the nose with the rifle and knocked him unconscious while breaking his nose, blood pouring out of his nose as he lay unconscious. I checked my shoulder. It was bleeding, but luckily the cut wasn't too deep. I knew I should have left and looked for help, but I remembered my camera and didn't want to lose it or all the photos I had on the memory card. I could also hopefully find my phone and call for the police. I started to limp back to the area I woke up, but on the way, I felt a sharp clamp on my leg. I'm an idiot. I had forgotten about the bear trap and stepped on it. My leg was trapped and I couldn't help but yell out in pain. I knelt down and tried to pry the bear trap off, but it was tight. I noticed the hunter had wrapped it in barbed wire while cutting into my leg. I had to put the rifle down as I continued to pry the bear trap off my leg. It was real tight and I couldn't pull it off. I heard a footstep and turned to look behind me. There was the hunter coming towards me with the knife held up, holding his gut which was pouring blood, his hand doing little to stop the bleeding. I turned and aimed the rifle at him and yelled, stop, as I pulled the trigger but the damn rifle jammed. My heart stopped. I looked at the hunter and his eyes fixated on me with anger. I knelt down and tried prying the bear trap open again. I gave up and felt around the trap as quick as I can. In a miracle, I pushed down the two spring which released the trap. I turned and ran as the hunter slashed at me. My leg was in even more pain and I was limping only managing by my adrenaline. I eventually found the area I woke up in and saw my ripped shirt, as well as my camera, but I couldn't find my phone. I quickly grabbed my camera and threw the sling over my shoulder. I turned and saw the hunter, bleeding from his gut and his face pale, knife and phone in his hand. My leg was so bad that I could no longer run. I stood my ground. I tried to unjam the rifle but couldn't as the hunter came close to me and raised the bowie knife to stab me. I hit him in the bullet wound with the butt of the rifle. He fell to his knees in pain holding his gut. I then grabbed the rifle by the barrel like a club and swung the rifle smacking the hunter in the jaw with the butt, knocking him out. As he lay unconscious, I knelt down and grabbed his bowie knife before leaving. I walked for like an hour before I bumped into a couple of hikers who called emergency services for me. I had to talk to the police for hours and told them my story, showing them my leg. After a long search, they never found the hunter. It all happened when I was 12 years old. I am now a grown man, but I will never forget that night. I still have nightmares about that night, and I never go out at night near the woods. Even during the day, I would have trouble walking through them. It was a normal afternoon during summer. I had finished playing outside with some friends and went inside for dinner, but before I went, I took a quick shower. When I was in my bedroom preparing myself, I heard some growling noises coming from outside. At first, I thought it was a dog, but it felt too close. I walked closer to the window. I wanted to see what animal was doing these growling noises. I couldn't see anything, but the growling was still there. I looked everywhere, but nothing. Later in the evening, after having dinner, I went to my room to play some more before sleeping. Since it was summer break, I could stay up longer. While playing, I started listening to stomp noises on the roof. My room is on the second floor, so I was directly under. I stayed there for a while, just listening to the stomping. It sounded like someone was walking on the roof. A few more seconds passed and the stomping stopped, but that was when a chilling sound came from behind me. Outside the window, 
A sound of scratching on the glass could be heard. I looked back and I saw it. A figure of something that looked like a dog and a man at the same time was outside my window, drooling and growling at the same time. I screamed. My parents came to my room but the creature was already gone. I told my parents what happened but they didn't seem to believe me. No one ever did. I love running in the night. No one is in the streets. I can run and appreciate the silence around me. Sometimes I run through town, other times I run in the woods. Close to my place, there are a few trails that go through the woods. It might be creepy for some, but I always enjoyed it very much. So this night, as I'm running on these trails, I started listening to running footsteps behind me. Because I wasn't listening to music while running, I stopped to check behind me to see if someone was there. I looked around but I saw nothing. Dead silence. I continued running after a few seconds. Same thing happened. Footsteps again. I stopped and asked out loud if someone was there. In my head, I thought it could be an animal or something like that. I waited a few more seconds until I listened to another noise. A growling, like a dog or wolf. It was the first time I had felt afraid on my night runs. The growling was getting closer. A few seconds later, in front of me, coming from behind me in some bushes. A creature, no, a man or a dog started running towards me. Frozen in terror, I looked at it for just a second, right before I started running as fast as I could. I think I've never ran so fast as that day. Luckily, I managed to get to the main road before it got me, but I didn't stop there. I kept running until I was home. When I arrived home, I couldn't believe in what I just saw. I tried to sleep as best as I could, and the next day, I did some research on local wildlife but I couldn't find anything, not until I'd looked for cryptid encounters. It looks like where I live, there are others that have seen the same creature I saw that day, the dog man. I never again ran at night. I was riding my e-bike through a road a few miles from my house. The road was surrounded by forest on both sides. Everything seemed fine until I heard a sound coming from the tree line. Even though I had no idea what it was, my worst fear had always been possibly getting attacked by a wild animal. So I sped up the e-bike to make sure I wasn't in any danger. But I was horrified to see that whatever made the sound was actually running behind the tree line alongside the road. What I thought was an animal at first would actually alternate from running on all fours to running on two legs. I started to freak out because it looked like a bear or a wolf was running like a human as well. I'm thinking it's just some weirdo in a costume, but what really concerned me was even though I was going almost 20 miles an hour on the e-bike, whatever this thing was was keeping up with me. I was just hoping I could make it to the gas station a few miles away to get some help. However, I was worried I'd run out of juice on the e-bike before I got there. By now, I was going full speed and this damn thing was still chasing me. The whole time I could hear something sprinting and grunting through the forest. Also, I could see it in my peripheral vision. And just a few seconds after that, that's when I finally hear it emerge from the tree line and chase me from behind on the road. It was too dark to probably see anything. I just leaned down on my e-bike and basically prayed. Thankfully, the lights of the gas station soon emerged from the distance. It wasn't until I rode into the parking lot that I finally looked behind me. But when I did, I saw nothing. None of the other customers looked like they saw anything either. I called my mom soon after to pick me up. I haven't ridden my e-bike around the area since then. I have made attempts with friends to look for whatever it was though, but we haven't had any luck finding it. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me tonight. I had a blast. Now the animations you've seen done were done by the Darkest Tale Animation Studio. Their channel is going to be listed in the description. Now these videos are over there on his channel, but he's given me permission to use them here. 
I figured it's a good way to get him some exposure. Maybe some of you don't know about him. He's a good guy and does a lot of great work. You guys definitely should go check him out. Give him some love. DT, thanks so much for letting me do this, buddy. I appreciate it. But with that, remember, just because you couldn't see it, doesn't mean it wasn't watching you.